what are your thoughts with regard to the need for more training and, and higher education for disaster risk reduction and, and adaptation to climate change in relation to staff within the national governments, the disaster officers, the international agencies and, and some of the NGOs? Is there a bigger need? Well, in all the different roles I've had in my work as, as an architect, as an artist, researcher, writer, etc., the one job I think is probably the most important has been being an educator or trainer. Um, I've greatly enjoyed this role, finding it both challenging and deeply rewarding. Uh, many of us are advocates for education and training as routes to major progress. However, I feel that these subjects are still uh, very neglected by public officials and particularly by politicians. And training and education generally are starved, absolutely starved of funding support, failing to secure the continuity that's required. Uh, we began running training, 12 week training courses in disaster management back in 1982, and they were exhausting to lead. Since we were having to inv invent the best ways to train demanding senior officials coming from all over the world. The courses were well funded by the British government and other governments, UN, Red Cross and other agencies. Um, this was one of the only international courses in the world at that time. And we made sure that each course had a very strong risk reduction element, also disaster recovery. We found it quite hard to know what to put in these courses but we take the participants to visit UK disaster or hazard sites where the risks were, were minuscule compared to what they've been exposed to in their home countries, such as China, etc. I remember one embarrassing experience going to one site where there was flooding on the River Thames and we had a Chinese professor with us and he inquired how deep the water was at the height of the flooding and he was told about 1.5 metres. Then he asked, how long does that, this flood last? The answer was about three weeks. After a long pause, he responded, in my country, we just totally ignore this problem. He then described the tenfold increase that they had to cope with in the floods he managed in China. So I suspect that some of the students must have thought that the UK wasn't a particularly ideal place for such courses. But we certainly introduced them to concepts of risk reduction and, uh, and that built up a whole international community of uh, potential activists. If you compare, for example, a typical disaster management official working for an NGO or working for a government or a UN agency, he might get no training whatsoever on this subject in his or her entire career. That's not unusual. There is an exception though for staff in emergency services who normally receive ongoing training as a regular part of their work. Now, if you compare this disaster official with an airline pilot who's trained initially and continually where they're required to go through a continuing professional development, CPD, every six months or so. And through this ongoing process, they're brought up to speed on what's happening. And they cannot remain as an active airline pilot without having these regular upgrades to their knowledge and working practices. Now that pattern, alas, is totally different from disaster risk management field. And yet lives depend on the capabilities of both airline pilots as well as disaster managers. And I believe that the neglect of training require requirements for all public officials working at every level in disaster field remains a source of great concern still to this day. And the other aspect of training relates directly to disaster risk reduction. And, and here's something which I think is particularly important. If you would build a flood protection measure now in 2021, any project will reflect the technological limits of 2021. It can't go beyond that it can't go into the technology of 2025 because that doesn't yet exist. But, and here's the important point, if an official is trained well or undertakes a higher degree, that person will benefit from that early investment in say 10, 15, 20 years ahead in their career. So any significant training in 
education is investing deep into the future, and that's what makes it so unique. So therefore, you would imagine it would get the kind of priority attention, but that doesn't yet happen. I'm not quite sure why, but I think it could be that politicians like to cut ribbons on new projects. They like press coverage with photographs and films of tangible projects. It's not easy to cut a ribbon of a, of a, of a training course or make a film of investment in PhD research. So it may be this lack of political vis visibility that's the problem. Maybe that's the reason for the neglect. I supposed when we set up a training program in disaster management, I wrongly assumed it would be maintained over time with inevitable adaptations. Our Oxford Polytechnic Oxford Brooks course ran from 1982 to 96. It was quite hard to keep it up to date, but we managed to keep reinvigorating the course to meet the changing needs of participants being trained in this rapidly developing subject. But when I left as course leader, the course disappeared. And it also disappeared in other places due to other leaders leaving. For example, we had a strong international training program in place for tier funds partner organizations. And in my colleague, by call, we had a brilliant leader. Uh, Mike ran courses with me in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And we both believe we'd established an ongoing training program. But alas, when Mike left Tier Fund, the training, when Mike left Tier Fund, the training also left. Sadly, these courses were often just one person deep, that of their leaders or instigators. They never became institutionalized, despite the reality that training needs to continue and also to expand. Uh, looking back too, there was an excellent initiative in the 1980s called DMTP, Disaster Management Training Programme, and this was set up by the University of Wisconsin under the leadership of Don Schramm and Paul Thompson. The programme was an extraordinarily enlightened joint initiative by UNHCR and UNDP. And I recall attending various courses in Wisconsin, etc. Training of trainers, we had them in Wisconsin, Bangkok, and in Manila. And it was an ambitious online program was devised with it, and the training guidelines were pure state-of-the-art, brilliantly written. But after a few years, it all collapsed abruptly due to a change of priorities within the UN agencies, or perhaps training had just ceased to be a fashionable funding priority. And at present in 2021, there is a UN organization called Capacity for Disaster Reduction Initiative called CADRI, a global partnership designed to complement in-country expertise in and beyond the United Nations system. I just hope it will survive and not suffer a similar fate to DMTP. Uh, perhaps I can return to one key aspect of training. I recall a memorable disaster field visit in one of our courses in the 1980s. Uh, we took a group of about 12 participants to Tewkesbury. Uh, it's a flood prone part of Britain. The group included the Chief of Disaster Risk Planning in Nigeria. We sat down in this room with the Chief Engineer at one end of the table and he described the flood problem in Tewkesbury. And he spoke, of fact, he spoke about the fact that he'd made some very, very big mistakes. He then proceeded to describe how his, how his staff had inserted poles beside the river, indicating the depth of water. And this was to guide motorists along roads where there was very shallow flooding. Uh, however, in, recent, in the recent severe floods, the roads were inundated with very deep floodwaters, up to two meters in depth. And uh, several cars narrowly escaped being swept away by cascading flood currents, unaware of the depth of water. Our speaker then described how he rectified his mistake by marking the poles with numbers indicating the water depth. And then he then proceeded to describe one mistake after another and the positive steps he took to make improvements. The next day we were back in Oxford in our classroom and I was leading a subject then about attitudes needed by disaster managers, not just the required skills and knowledge that we taught most of the time. 
and I asked the participants how best to teach constructive attitudes. A long silence followed. And then this chief from Nigeria described how he'd been thinking about this while lying in bed the previous night. He told our group that he'd been perplexed as to what transpired during that field visit. And he, he vividly described the visit, I recall it very well. We sat down with a complete stranger, he told us, uh, and he told us all about his mistakes. Well, I'm in charge of disaster planning in Nigeria, but I would never dream of telling anybody my mistakes. Why would I? Particularly not with strangers. I might tell my wife, but nobody else. He then described how he pondered why this engineer had shared his failures with us. And he reflected that he did not do this to show off, but rather to share his mistakes and the lessons he'd learned for our benefit. And his final words were on the lines of, I began to realize yesterday that I need to learn a lot more. I need, I need to be a lot more open. And one thing I'm learning from you and this course, Ian, is that we don't have to be so protective about our knowledge. And in future, I'm going to share my mistakes and lessons with my staff. His words came as a surprise to me, and I had no idea this learning was happening as a result of the visit. But this man picked up something important for his own situation and it probably stayed with him for the rest of his professional life. I guess that's why I'm so enthusiastic about training. And you also learned a lot yourself during those trainings from the colleagues in developing countries, I presume. It was a two-way experience. In hindsight, bringing all these people from different countries all over the world to Oxford, was this the right approach? Or would you be more in favor of working in country in terms of training or supporting a regional training setup so that people would know the context better. Yes, I was gaining from them all tremendously as they shared their experiences, uh, particularly with, and that particularly happened within country courses where they, where they were familiar with local contexts. I agree with you totally, Bruno. Mid-career training is best held in country or within a given region with hands-on active training cast tasks, such as visiting sites, particularly post-disaster recovery sites, and, uh, and placing participants into decision-making roles using disaster simulations. Uh, as I reflect back, we watched that change of venue happening towards in-country training during the 1990s, as countries rapidly developed their own capacity. I remember an amusing experience with an Indian minister with responsibility for disaster management when he asked to meet me during a Delhi conference where I was giving the keynote address. So I went along to his office where he was sitting behind a huge desk. And he said to me in a rather angry voice, I've asked to meet you because I want to ask you a single question. This is, I want to know what from you, what skills are needed in disaster management, which we do not have here in India. Well, I pointed out that in India, they had all the skills needed in abundance, to which he then asked, in that case, why are you here? I told him with a smile on my face that I was here because he had invited me. Um, he was obviously unaware of that. Gradually, consultants and trainers from Europe, North America, Australia, including ourselves, were being replaced by highly skilled people from Asia, Latin America and Africa. And this was a positive development. Uh, I, I'm a great uh, believer in horizontal learning about disaster recovery and, and creativity. And one of these exciting rewards in running training courses and when horizontal learning between participants actually occurs. Suddenly a participant takes initiative by absolutely electrifying a course, it all comes alive. I remember we were running a course in the early 1983, I think it was, it was about disaster recovery and somebody came from the Red Cross to speak to us. He put a slide on the screen uh, these were the teaching tools of our day when we had overhead projectors. And the slide declared that the aim of disaster recovery is to restore normality. As always, people were writing down what was on the screen. And there was a sudden shout from the back of the room. 
I protest, I protest. Would you please take that slide, put it in your briefcase and never show it to anybody again? Well, the lecturer was obviously a bit taken aback by this intervention and said, what is the problem? And a nurse from Jamaica responded, you've just said that the aim of disaster recovery is to restore normality. Well, I live in Kingston, Jamaica, where people live in cardboard boxes. That is their normality. And do you really want to tell us to put people back in cardboard boxes after a disaster? Of course not. You've got to make some steps forward. You've got to secure improvements. Disaster recovery must never rebuild the vulnerable status quo. It was a just fantastic moment. Since the whole course was set alight, it was just a, a, an amazing moment. Uh, as, as, as everybody talked about this on buses and evening receptions uh, while we were going here and there, they all remember, I'm sure they remember to this day, that reaction that came. I can also remember another exciting exchange. We were running a training of trainers course with many policemen attending. Uh, the topic of the day was concerning basic requirements for emergency managers. And they were all listing various items that were being written up on flip charts. Uh, one item concerned the need for emergency staff to be familiar with what they called standard operating procedures, SOPs. I was chairing this particular session and I said at the end of the session, right, what's missing from your lists? Nobody could think of anything. Uh, and so there was a long pause. Uh, I said, well, I can think of one word that seems to be missing and that's the word creativity. Uh, a senior British official at that point said, well, that's the very last thing that I think I want from any policeman involved in any disaster. I want them to follow the standard operating procedures. I don't want any deviation. They've got to get on with the task as defined. Everybody immediately wrote it all down. And at that point, an African participant, I can see him now, said, I entirely disagree. In many of the places where I've worked, you don't have enough resources. There aren't enough people. There are insufficient vehicles. There's not enough of this and there's not enough of that. And we are trying to manage a massive problem. Now, when you're in this situation, you've got to make a, a lot out of a little. And then he had this wonderful little picture and making a lot out of a little requires a highly creative solution by highly creative people. So please add that to the list. That was such a valuable intervention because we were then cast, the whole group were cast in choosing between contrasting ideas. Actually, they're both needed. Reliance on well-proven standardized approaches versus devising creative innovative ways to maximize limited resources. Sometimes as leader, you just sit back and watch matters going ahead around you and you realize genuine learning is taking place. Um, perhaps I could also just mention something about higher education in relation to risk reduction. I had the privilege of being a professor in Cranfield University and in supervising doctoral research this was initially deeply frustrating, uh, a frustrating business because of a pattern where military people signed up to undertake research, but it failed to materialize as they went off to fight wars or were transferred to other operations. And none of the officers I met seemed motivated to undertake research. However, eventually I met in Oxford a brilliant school teacher from Iran, Yasmin Izadka, she was interested in teaching earthquake awareness to children in Iranian schools. And over the following years, she undertook an excellent PhD research into school education in Tehran against earthquakes. And then there was another vital research project by Titus Kuyor. Uh, he's now a key UN official based in UNDP in Ethiopia with responsibility for disaster reduction throughout Southern Africa. And his research concerned the earthquake resistance of hospitals in Accra to, in Ghana. Um, the third PhD student was Paul Venton, uh, as he conducted innovative field research on community-based disaster risk reduction in India 
and he used the crunch model to good effect in that study. These three students were just such a joy to supervise and the experience helped to build their careers and I certainly learned so much from them as they were learning from me. Um, I reflect on a strange encounter with the head of a British NGO. Uh, he once called me into his room and he was obviously troubled about training. <clears throat> he said, you're a great enthusiast for training. I responded, yes, yes, I am, very much so. And then with a perplexed frown, he crewed, why so? I then tried to explain the basis for my enthusiasm. You can watch people in the first week of training and they're fiddling with their pens, they look at their watches, they seem to make frequent visits to the lavatory, and they're making it pretty obvious that they're not fully engaged in the process. But often, very often, after about two weeks, you can see their concentration rising as they become active and they begin to argue, they debate, and suddenly you realize the subject is captivating them. And it's very exciting to watch that change. He responded, well, I'm glad you're so enthusiastic, but I'm certainly not. I said, well, you're the chief executive. Why are you not interested in training? He then asked me what I would expect from someone who'd undergone training. I thought for a bit and suggested that they probably return to their jobs with more confidence and might come back with increased commitment. He agreed with me about the extra confidence. And he began to, to list some of the typical demands of recently trained members of staff in his organization. He said, you know, they sit on the edge of my desk and start telling me my job. And what's more, they go to on, they, they ask to go on further training courses. Some of them even expect more responsibility, more money, and some of them leave for other organizations having been trained at our expense. Well, it was obvious we had quite opposite views on the value of training and education. And I recall saying to him that uh, I regarded the, uh, these negative consequences that he was listing, what seemed to me like symptoms of a very healthy organization, since these people were obviously growing in confidence and maturity through the training courses they'd been on. As we concluded the discussion, uh, I had the impertinence to suggest that he had achieved the position of CEO because people had invested in him throughout his career in past years. And all was being asked of trainers and trainees was that the similar process went on. And fundamentally, the agency he led wasn't just about development in Botswana or Bangladesh, it was about his own office, about helping staff to grow within his own place. So in conclusion, I'd love to have the opportunity to reinvigorate training. And if in my last years, I'm now 85, 80, and so I, if, if, if there could be an opportunity of trying to set up some kind of a short, sharp task force of people who could actually act as a catalyst to re-energize training in disaster risk reduction, I'd be absolutely thrilled to play a part in such process. By the way, I'm not 85, I'm 84. I made a mistake about that. Have you done already some online training recently, Ian? Uh, not much. I'd like to do that. I don't quite know how that could be done. Um, but I think that obviously there will be a need for online training in the past and we've got to work with it and I'd like to help with it and make it happen. Thanks so much for your thoughts on the need for training and on higher education. It's really an important subject and it is the best investment we can make in future generations to build up their DRR capacities. Uh, Bruno, I'm sorry about all these stories I've been telling you. Uh, they can get quite boring. No, no, I, I think the stories are just the best. The anecdotes are often the ones that will stick in the mind and have the most learning impact. Well, thank you very much, Bruno. It's been a great pleasure to have this interview and, and, and good wishes with these interviews as they proceed. It's a pleasure. 